So we hear this morning Jesus described as bread, the bread of life. We've been in a series called just basically the bread passages because we keep hearing I am the bread of life. And today um, Jesus actually goes so far as you have to eat my body and drink my blood if you're going to have new life, which for his audience, the Jewish people, was pretty disturbing because, well, for one, the Greek, or the Greek word that he used was actually, for eat, was basically munch. If you munch my body, and the word he used for drink was slurp, so if you slurp my blood, you're going to have life. And these were a people who really worked hard to eat only the right things because that's what they thought was really important. That was one of the laws that they followed. And blood in particular was considered unclean. So they had a lot of rituals around um, the slaughtering of animals and cleanliness and other things. So this idea of not just eating and drinking um, Jesus's body and blood, but munching and slurping it was probably pretty disturbing and in fact was so confusing that next week you will hear the disciples say to him, what the heck are you talking about? And then a whole bunch of them leave. So we're not alone when we hear these sorts of things and think, what is going on. Like, I sort of get the whole what's happening at communion with the wafers and the cup of wine and all of this, but this is way more, like, messy than what we're experiencing typically in church. And so Jesus is also making this parallel with um, the um, Israelites when they were um, in Exodus, right? They were freed from enslavement in Egypt and got lost in the desert and were really struggling. And that's when manna appeared to them. It was a bread-like substance that seemed to come from heaven and appeared, you know, in the morning like dew, and they could eat their fill, but they couldn't save it. They had to just, you know, eat their fill and then leave what was there, and then the next day it would reappear. So this idea of being fed in a way that they had not, they did not have to work for it, they did not have to plow fields or tend or harvest, it just showed up for them. And um, the word manna means, what is it? So again, I appreciate the fact that at least for me, when I'm hearing scripture, often I'm thinking, I'm not sure what this means. And I find it a little reassuring when we find out that they sometimes were confused too, even in their story. So we had, what is it bread for the people? And Jesus is comparing himself to what is it? Like, what is it bread? Now, what is Jesus? What is this that Jesus is offering? And um, so what we do know, though, is we hear in John 10, 10, of course, that Jesus offers us life and offers it abundantly. Like, his promise is so much more than just having full tummies and going day to day. There is so much more to that, and there's so much more than eating and then we die. You know, it's this promise that this bread actually will bring us eternal life. And so I've been thinking a lot about what does it mean to be fed this week? And that is not a hard thing for me because our family loves food so much. In fact, at one point, my kids and I were laughing about the fact that it seemed as though we were either talking about what we just ate, talking about what we were currently eating, or wondering about what we would be eating next. So my oldest, Corinne, said we need a tagline that our family is living our lives one meal at a time, which is basically what we're doing. Like, we love to snack, we love to eat, and I was realizing so many of our family traditions and rituals center on food, which I don't think is uncommon. You know, so many of us have very particular traditions when it comes to Thanksgiving or birthdays or celebrations or holidays. And so some of ours that are more, maybe I want to say unique, you probably might think are a little bit weird. Um, so one of the things that we used to do is on the last day of school before Christmas break, 
we would put on pajamas and go to IHOP for pancakes because <laughs> for dinner because it was like we're getting ready to have this time of like really resting and relaxing and celebrating and setting aside the work and just playing and on the last day of school for the school year first morning of summer we always had ice cream for breakfast because why not? It's summer. It's ice cream. Like, you need to have some fun. And we just have a lot of different rituals like that. But then I thought back to, you know, when I was a kid and we visited my dad's family in Indiana, um, my great-grandmother lived in a mobile home right next to their house. And after I would have breakfast at my grandparents' house, I would walk across the yard and go into her house and she would feed me corn, uh, frosted flakes. And I would have my second breakfast of frosted flakes, which was so awesome because my parents would never let me have sugar cereal. <laughs> and she always just had them tucked in this little corner of the cabinet. And it just was this special little tradition of just the two of us where I felt so fed, right? It was so much more. I wasn't hungry. I had just had breakfast. But I was hungry for that love and for that attention and that sense of community and being seen and feeling important and special in the way that we all hunger, right? And we're always looking for what can fill us up and fill that need in us. And Jesus is talking about that now. And I also think that there are particular times in our lives where we have a literal hunger for community because we are isolated. You know, we're sick or we're ill or something has happened. And what do we tend to do? We tend to rush in with food. You know, my parents were Midwesterners. It was always a casserole. It seems in Colorado, it's more like roast chicken, probably because it's healthier, um, and salads, really big salads. But it's such a beautiful thing that we actually recognize, I'm going to feed you. I'm going to do this effort on your behalf. And I think it's not surprising that just like the what is it manna bread and the what is it Jesus bread, often when somebody appears at the door with a meal, the first question you ask is, what is it? Um, it's just that idea of it's so wonderful to be met in our needs and to be seen and cared for. And so we find one another truly in our relations. We find God in our relationships with one another. God's too big and vast for us to know and understand. And so we look to one another to mirror a bit of God back to us. And so much of Jesus' life is acting to mirror his expectation of how we are in community, how we walk through the world, how we care for one another, how we show up with the capital L love that honors justice and mercy and peace and tranquility and all of these things that really give us a foretaste of heaven and what it may be. So Jesus did say today, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. And so we're confused by that. And what does it mean to live in Jesus and have Jesus live in us? And what does it mean to know that we are be, will be going someplace after this life that is perfect? It's perfect love. Um, but that is such a big thing. It's too much for us to understand. And so what ends up happening is Jesus is trying to describe a place and a way of living that is so beyond our understanding that there are, almost aren't words to get it. And so one of the comparisons I was making is you may have heard that old, sto old story of four blind men who are trying to describe an elephant. And each one of them is positioned in a different spot. And one of them is saying, well, there's these big flappy things that like make wind and you have to watch out for them. And another one saying, no, there's this really long solid thing that waves and it's kind of wet at the end. And another says, no, they're like almost these big, um, big firm like legs or feet or something. It's really solid. And then another one says, no, there's this thing at the back that it's like a rope that swings around and back and forth. Well, they're each, they have their each glimmer, this glimpse of what this elephant is, but it's impossible in not seeing to know exactly what is an elephant. 
and I was imagining what would it be like to try to describe to someone who has never had a peach, has never tasted a peach, to describe biting into a Palisade peach that's perfectly ripe on a hot August day. What words could you use for that to really describe that experience? Or that cup of coffee that's so perfect in the morning, made even more perfect because someone we love has actually prepared it for us and presents us, and then we just take that first sip. Or chocolate. Or just, you know, you can kind of name almost anything. A place that you visited that was so moving or powerful or touched you in some way that you want other people to know, and yet it's so hard to describe. We just don't have the words. And I think that that's a bit of what Jesus was experiencing in trying to come up with examples. And I think that's a bit why we hear answers in, in parables. You know, Jesus could have easily said, someone asks a question and Jesus says, yep, here's the answer. The answer is X. And then everybody would be like, okay, there's the answer. But instead, we hear a story. We hear a story that kind of answers the question, but sometimes doesn't really answer the question, or we're a little more confused than when we started, but we're thinking about it. We're remembering as opposed to an answer that we probably forget. And so we hear stories about shepherds who love their flocks and keep watch by night over them or women who lose a coin and are frantic and then find it and throw a big party, or fathers who are estranged from their sons and miss them, and then the son returns, and there's so much joy in the welcome back home. And we also hear stories of God's great love for imperfect kings. You know, we've been hearing about Saul and David and now Solomon. These men who, you know, had good things, but also had really made some really bad choices along the way. And yet we see they weren't perfect, and yet God claims them, right? And we see Jesus welcoming those who are described as the other, who nobody else would draw near, and he goes to them. He gravitates toward them. He calls them by name. And just that reminder of not only is this bread available to us, but Jesus' bread is available to everyone, and you don't have to earn it. There's nothing you can do, in fact, that will make you earn it. You are worthy simply as a result of God's great love for you and for your um, agreement to be in this community that we have with God. God covenants with us, and we covenant with one another. And so we heard again in our epistle from Ephesians um, the descriptions of how important it is to be in community. You know, Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs. He recognized they needed one another just as surely as they were trying to build up this community of followers of Jesus. And Des Bishop Desmond Tutu um, described the following. He said, it's not, I think, therefore I am, it is rather I am human because I belong, I participate, I share. And that's what I think we are all seeking, is to be known in our humanness, to not have to be perfect, and to share with one another the great gifts of this world and this life, whether we're the ones who are offering or we're the ones who are receiving. And so in our communities, we have agreements with one another. We have boundaries, we have expectations, we have um, rules of how we engage with each other, and then we also have ways of knowing how to seek forgiveness and reconciliation. It's not a coincidence that we say our confession every week where we talk about what we have done and what we have left undone, where we are seeking that reminder again and again and again that we are in fact forgiven, that God loves us, that it's going to be okay. And so we have our baptismal covenant, 
reminds us to seek and serve Christ in all persons, um, loving our neighbors as ourselves. We have our vestry here at St. Luke's who just recently has adopted a communications covenant which affirms that we will actually talk to one another when we're in disagreement, that we will commit to resolving our differences, that when we have any issues with one another, we will go directly to the other person to resolve that rather than talking to others. And as part of that covenant, we agree that if we don't feel able to do that for whatever reason, we will seek help from someone else to do it with us. That it is that important to be in right relationship with one another and to not be complaining to the wrong people. You know, when we complain, when we gossip, it might feel as though we are closer because we're in agreement and we're sharing things, but really it tears community apart. It keeps us from really trusting each other, from really being able to believe I am accepted in this place and I am loved and I am known and that we really do care enough about one another that I see the Christ in you, and therefore I will not disparage that Christ by being unloving toward you. It's hard. I am not saying any of this is easy. And so again, we have these reminders again and again of how much God loves us and how we don't have to earn it. We just have to keep being willing to try and being in relationship. And even when we're not willing, we're still going to be loved by God, and it's still going to be okay. And so um, we just are always called to remember that we are, in fact, one body and one spirit in, in Christ, and that G following Jesus means committing to that kind of community. So we are looking to Jesus to know how we're going to walk in love, and we're looking to one another to see what does God look like in the world? How are you mirroring that love of Jesus to me and to others? And then finally, um, we are abiding in God as surely as God is abiding in us. Jesus reminded that today. You know, I've talked about, I have that little Jesus that lives in my heart that my fourth grade teacher told me about, but I live in Jesus's heart too. And that's kind of an amazing thing when you think about it. Like, it is amazing that we all reside in God's heart all of the time. We are so loved. Today, like the rest of this season, we're going to be hearing in Eucharistic prayer C the following. Open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this holy communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. When we forget this promise, the bread and the wine remind us. St. Augustine of Hippo said of the Eucharist, Behold what you are, become what you eat. You know, we hear that from nutritionists, you are what you eat. And this every week, my friends, is this opportunity to literally remember we have God in us, and God is out here looking to us to serve in God's name.